With House of the Dragon revitalizing the Game of Thrones franchise that many thought would just crash and burn after the final season of the original series, I want to make a video about the real-world inspiration that goes into the world-building of A Song of Ice and Fire. Let's look at the map of the known world. Since House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones are loosely based off of medieval Europe, the world map is clearly incomplete. People in Europe during the Middle Ages obviously didn't have access to satellites that proved the existence of much of East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, let alone the Americas, Australia, and Antarctica. This knowledge would arrive through the ways of the Age of Exploration, when Europeans were able to sail off the continental shelf, starting first with the Portuguese. In Game of Thrones, the rough equivalent of Europe is Westeros, a continent named such because, well, it's the most westward continent known at this point. The other major continent is Essos, which is roughly inspired by parts of Asia, namely the Middle East and the Central Asian steppe, but have other parts of inspiration from other parts of Asia further away as you go east, but we know less and less about them because, of course, this is coming from a quasi-European perspective on Westeros. Anyway, overall, the continent of Westeros stretches vertically rather than horizontally. This vertical orientation means that there is a massive amount of variation in biomes and climates as you move north to south rather than east to west, and it also is co further complicated by the fact that seasons can take years rather than just months. Westeros stretches all the way from what seems to be the North Pole, or at the very least, an area so cold, remote, and inhospitable we know very little about it. The most northern area we know is the land of always winter, which is shrouded in mystery. While there are clearly supernatural elements in the Song of Ice and Fire, there also seems to be some inspiration from the concept of Hyperborea, a mythological frigid land some of the classical Greeks believed in, probably based off of some limited exploration off the coast of northwestern Europe, which over the time was greatly exaggerated into a really cool yet bullshit story about super divine humans living in frigid winters. Hyperborea is where we get the term boreal forest from. And what do you know? Boreal forests dominate the landscapes just south of the tundra and ice sheets of the lands of always winter. This area is home to the free folk, or wildlings, north of the wall. With a few exceptions, these people are not a unified nation, but rather competing factions of clans and tribes north of the wall. They are a stateless people, who oftentimes view people to the south of the wall as decadent, weak urban dwellers similar to the way that many nomadic peoples in our world viewed civilized people. Likewise, the people south of the Wall see the wildlings as savages. Again, not unlike the way that many settled urban dwellers viewed nomads and hunter-gatherers. Some have compared the giant wall in A Song of Ice and Fire to Hadrian's Wall, even though Hadrian's Wall in what is now the UK isn't particularly impressive, obviously, but nonetheless, it is a wall to separate two distinct, different groups of people. In the series, A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, the reason why the wall exists is because the first humans to arrive in Westeros, who are now known as the First Men, fought off the Others, also known as the White Walkers, and built a wall to separate them. However, this left some humans on the other side, and after periods of time, they became different identities, different cultures. The first men arrived through Westeros from Essos via a formerly existing land bridge, similar to the Bering Strait's former land bridge that we see between Siberia and Alaska. While the free folk do not have a unified culture, part of their shared identity is not being part of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. There are also other races, like giants and the children of the forest. These predate the first men, or humans, at all. I would say that they're roughly analogous to the pre-Indo-European peoples in Europe, a series of cultures that once dominated the continent, but for the most part are lost to the sands of time. South of the Wall lies the Seven Kingdoms and the Riverlands. The most northern one is, well, the North 
For such a creative guy, I'm surprised George R. R. Martin couldn't come up with a better name than The North. The North, led by House Stark, is loosely based off of Scotland, with its highlands and lowlands, lochs, cold winters, austere castles, gingers, and inedible food. There are certain geographic and cultural aspects that make this one of the most distinct regions in Westeros, similar to how Scotland is so distinct from the rest of Britain. The first human ethnic group, the First Men, dominate this region, unlike the southern parts of the continent, which are dominated by another ethnic group called the Andals. The First Men used to dominate all of Westeros before the Andal invasion. George R. R. Martin probably took inspiration from the Celtic peoples. The Celts used to dominate Western Europe, but due to conquest by the Latin Romans and their Germanic peoples, the Celts are now relegated to small pockets of what are now Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Cornwall, and Brittany. The religion in this part of the North is based around what are called the Old Gods, which are not really gods, but rather spirits of nature. This is known as animism, which by and large is a sort of belief system that sees spirits or conscious beings in various natural material forms, be they trees, rivers, rocks, wind, the turtles, whatever you call it. They all supposedly have spirits. It's very grounded in nature, and animism has existed in several forms across various human cultures, including some pre-Christian Celtic practices, even though today we tend to associate it more with Native Americans. In more recent years, it has been resurrected by the pagan religion of Wicca, which has become popular by either A, old, horny, far-left hippie woman, or B, far-right young men who think that they're the descendants of Odin and like to parade around with tiki torches. Anyway, the North is connected to the rest of the continent via a tiny strip of swampy land, which acts as a natural barrier, making it hard to invade for both sides. Unless you have dragons, of course. I guess you could say that it's kind of like a natural Hadrian's Wall between Roman Britain and the Celtic Picts to the North in what are now Scotland. This, after all, is part of the reason why England and Scotland exist as two distinct entities. Off the southwest coast of the north, you get the Iron Isles, led by House Greyjoy. This region is loosely based off of Scandinavia during the Viking Age. The Greyjoy motto is, We do not sow. After all, the soil in this region is like that of Nordic countries. And, like Nordic countries, it by and large sucks, and the climate isn't great either. This means that most people rely not on the land, but the sea for their livelihoods, be it fishing, crabbing, or a life of raiding on coastal villages of the mainland, similar to what the Danes and Norsemen did when they were Vikings raiding across coastal Europe and beyond. Like the Vikings, they are by and large considered to be more of a nuisance than a major threat, to most other kingdoms, and their lands are among the poorest. However, they have produced some of the best sailors due to their maritime culture. These people worship what is called the Drowned God, and I suppose it makes sense for a maritime culture to celebrate some sort of ocean god. This is quite similar to how Scandinavians were one of the last peoples of Europe to abandon their pagan gods in favor of Christianity. If you move further south, you will get to the Riverlands, a flat area of, well, rivers, which are great for farming, fishing, and logistics. However, there's a catch, and that's not a pun. It is flat, and it is centrally located, which makes it very vulnerable to invasions. This region is one of the most blood zones, and before the Targaryens united it, it was largely a contested area invaded by Northerners, Ironborn, and Southerners. This area is fairly analogous to Central Europe, namely the Northern European Plain, in what is now Germany and Poland. The central location of mostly flat lands and river systems are very productive, but it also makes them susceptible to invasions, fragmentations, and stoic battle-hardened people. These people, like most of the Westerosi, are ethnically Andals, and 
they take part in the religion known as the New Gods. The Andals were a group of people, also from Westeros, who invaded lands of the First Men and ended up dominating the First Men everywhere except for the most northern and southern parts of the continent. They spread the religion of the New Gods. One that sounds polytheistic at first glance, but the seven gods and goddesses are really just different manifestations of the same entity, similar to the way that the Trinity exists in Christianity, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit really being different manifestations of one god, or the Brahma of Hinduism, where you have tons of different gods that are really just manifestations of one pantheistic entity. So you could maybe argue that it's pantheistic, polytheistic, and monotheistic all at the same time. Anyway, this religion also forbids slavery. Similar to how Europe in the Middle Ages preferred serfdom over, over slavery. The Andals first arrived in the Eri, a highly mountainous region, not too different from that of the Swiss Alps. And like the real nation of Switzerland, the Eri pretty much stays neutral throughout most of the events of Game of Thrones, spoiler alert, until much of the very end. This region also is home to numerous mountain tribes that resist the lords and ladies of the Eyrie and its feudal states, similar to the way that many mountainous regions tend to have more rugged individuals that deny the authority of the state. To the west is the Rock, home to House Lannister. This area is pretty hilly and rocky, although not very mountainous. It is where most of the gold deposits are held, making it the wealthiest region. Some have argued that it's based off of England, but I don't really think that there's a real-world inspiration that is particularly strong here. East of the Westerlands are the Crown Lands, including the City of King's Landing. This is the Seat of the Crown, the largest population center and the head of the Religion of the Seven. Its location on the sea and fair climate and fairly central location makes it great for communicating with the rest of the continent and the rest of the known world. Off the coast, there is also Dragon's Isle, a home to the Targaryens, after they left Essos, but before they conquered Westeros itself. South of this area lies the Stormlands of House Baratheon. This area also doesn't seem to have any strong inspiration from the real world, it's just really rocky and has a lot of storms, so Stormlands. Man, I, really, I, I could have expected some better world building from than this. You got some storms, thunderstorms, who cares, you got that anywhere. Anyway. However, the same is not true for the Reach, led by House Tyrell. This area is the second richest due to its fertile land. It's the breadbasket and an agrarian feudal economy. In reality, it should probably be the richest part of the continent. Because of this, its large food production also makes it the most populated. It's home to the second largest city, Old Town led by House Hightower. It is where the Maester Citadel is located and acts as the central university library and center of learning for the continent. This region also has a strong culture of chivalry, cuisine, and art. I would probably equate this region to France due to its geography and culture. The last region is Dorne, which is heavily based off of Muslim Spain, or the Emirate of Cordoba. In fact, the Dornish scenes are actually filmed in southern Spain, which was once held by Arabs and Berbers, which dominated the region of Andalusia. However, eventually Christian Spaniards would conquer it along with the Portuguese, hence why you have Spain and Portugal. This region has an arid desert climate. Spain just so happens to be the only European country to actually have true deserts and arid canyons in Europe. The people here are not Andals or First Men, but rather the Roina, a people group who migrated later from Essos and settled in Dorne, intermarrying with the locals. This led to the rise of House Martell, and the blossoming of Dornish culture. People here look more like Middle Easterners, or at the very least Southern Europeans, with olive skin and dark hair and brown and black eyes. This group of people resisted the Targaryens for a long period of time, making use of their desert and canyon terrain. As a result, their culture is distinctly different. They tend to have more lax attitudes towards women, freedom, and children out of wedlock. And, for the most part, are, for lack of a better word, more liberal than the other parts of Westeros. 
and that's the continent of Westeros. However, you might be like Arya and ask, what's west of Westeros? Well, we don't know, but spoiler alert, 3, 2, 1. During the last episode of Game of Thrones, Arya sails west, looking for the supposed new lands west of Westeros. This could be seen as the fictional world's version of the beginning of the Age of Exploration, when Europeans, or in this case, North Westerosis, explore unknown parts of the world. There is probably some fan fiction about Arya's adventures in Emeritus by now.